Namaskar Nileshok. This is a series on precession of the Earth's axis and its consequences or its and or its implications for antiquity of Indian civilization, but also understanding a timestamp. But in order to understand the developments in science, technology, philosophy, everything else um, in the context of Indian civilization, Hindu civilization. I have already made four parts in this series. So this one is actually a summary part. I am making it at the end, but in the playlist, I am going to place it as part number one, as a summary. And then uh, if somebody can understand all of this with the summary part, then great. They don't have to listen to the remaining four parts, but the remaining four parts uh, do cover the material in greater detail. Uh, so I would encourage you to uh, listen to those parts, not just once, but multiple times. Anyways, let's begin with the summary part, the precession of the Earth's axis and its effect on visual astronomy. There is a shlok in Mahabharat which says uh, the Vidusha, the learned people, when explaining a certain thing, they do it both ways. They do it in a compact form like Sankshepa, but they also do it in a Vistar. Okay? In other words, uh, in a Sanskrit context or in the context of ancient Indian narratives, we can refer to these uh, or these methods as Akarana and Prakarana. Prakarana kind of goes in an expansive way, discusses pros and cons, different viewpoints and so on, as is relevant to the subject. On the other hand, the Akarana just focuses on getting to the gist of it. It assumes that the other aspects, either the person knows, the person who is uh, trying to learn it, or has enough intelligence to go back and refer to extended versions, extended aspects of the subject, if and when required. That's considered, so the four part series that I already completed, it's, it will fall into that uh, Prakarana or the Vistar. And still, I will warn you that in some sense, it was a, a somewhat a compact form, okay? Because there is a, so much to discuss about this precision of the Earth's axis, so many aspects. I have focused in this series only on the specific one that are of crucial importance, which is to say there are many other implications, but they may not, or they are not of crucial importance. And this particular summary portion is even more compact. So let's get there. Tropical versus sidereal, this is the foundation of understanding the precession of the Earth's axis. A tropical calendar is a Rutu Chakra calendar, a calendar that is purely solar in nature. And therefore, it is a calendar that describes the different seasons because seasons are caused by the sun and the position of the sun with respect to the earth and with respect to the inclination of the Earth's axis. The change in season or the occurrence of a specific season has everything to do with the sun, has nothing, absolutely nothing to do with the nakshatra reference frame, and it has absolutely nothing to do with the moon, the moment of the moon, the position of the moon, the phase of the moon. All right. What is a sidereal calendar? If you start with the tropical calendar, which is a Rutu Chakra Panchang, sidereal calendar is essentially taking a tropical calendar and then superimposing the nakshatra reference frame on top of it. That's it. Now, the sun has its own motion and the reference nakshatra frame has its own motion. The, ref, the motion of the nakshatra reference frame is actually due to the precession of the Earth's axis. And then we have a one additional celestial body available to us, which was used very uh, ingeniously in a very creative and innovative way by the ancient Indian sages, ancient Indian astronomers to create the world's 
most sophisticated, precise, and accurate, ingenious, innovative calendar called India's Indian lunisolar calendar. So the lunar motions are also superimposed on this structure to create the Indian lunisolar calendar. Quickly to understand the difference then <clears throat> between a tropical year, like tropical solar year, and a sidereal solar year. In fact, both of them are, in some sense, we will say solar years. Now, eventually, the concept is also extended to the lunar year, but that's not the part of this discussion. The gap between a tropical year and a sidereal year is about 20 minutes. So if the way the tropical year is measured, let's say it begins with the point of vernal equinox. From there, sun starts going along its ecliptic. And when it comes back to that exactly same position, that is the position of the vernal equinox, we call that tropical year. Sidereal year is Let's begin at the same point because that will help us understand this. The sun's position begins at the vernal equinox, let's say, but we note down the sun's position with respect to the background nakshatra reference frame. And for the sun to go around the ecliptic and come back to exactly the same point where it now aligns with the background nakshatra reference frame from where it began, that time period is called a sidereal year. Now, there is a difference of 20 minutes between the tropical year and sidereal year. In one way, we can say the tropical year, which is to say the point of vernal equinox to vernal equinox, the second vernal equinox, when it completes the circle, it comes 20 minutes earlier. Then for the sun to go and attain the same place with respect to the nakshatra reference frame from where it began. Now, 20 minutes sounds very small. Well, it is. So for practical purposes, the tropical year and sidereal year come to a close on exactly the same day. But over time, what's going to happen is these 20 minutes or equivalent to 50 arc second in the language of 360 degrees of the ecliptic, they are going to add up. In three years, it will add up to what? One hour. And therefore, in... 72 years, it will add up to three, one hour times 24 or three times, you know, whatever the way you want to do the math, it will mean in about 72 years, there will be a difference between the tropical and a solar, there will be a gap of about one day. You can do that math and see uh, how long it will take because 72 years, it is a gap of about one day which is also to say one degree, and there are 360 degrees. So therefore, if you do 72 times 360, that gives you a number close to 26,000 years. That is the orbital period for the precession of the Earth's axis, okay, in the sky. Now, this creates various consequences. Before we go there, we can look at these three frames so that we understand these are three frames coming together to form this very sophisticated, the world's the most sophisticated, ingenious, innovative Indian lunisolar calendar. We have the background reference frame of nakshatra system. On that, we can superimpose the tropical calendar. Think of this as the Gregorian calendar, only the middle portion, okay? Uh, only the sun's position. And then on top of it, in the middle, we can uh, superimpose the moment of the, uh, moment of the moon. And Three together is our Indian lunisolar system. On the other hand, you may start looking at it in a slightly different fashion. If all that you're looking at is the sun going around the earth, okay, and making sure that the sun's particular position when it reaches the points of equinoxes or solstices, they are matched and exactly maintained in a calendar, then that's a Gregorian calendar, okay? It is a purely tropical calendar. If you add the lunar motion on top of it, and then you forget about the seasons per se, but only focus on 12 lunations of the moon. And in order for understanding the 12 lunations of the moon, because it's from Amavasya to Amavasya, and in that case, you need the reference point of a sun, because sun is what causes the phases. Other than that, if you don't take sun's position into account or air, 
seasons into accounts. Then 12 lunations of the moon is a purely lunar calendar that is an Islamic calendar. The Indian lunar solar calendar has both aspects of this, but something more, the background nakshatra reference frame. Each three of these entities have their own three different motions. Well, understand where it's coming from. One is the moon's motion around the earth. Another is the sun's motion around the earth. And the third, the motion of the nakshatra reference frame, which actually is due to the earth's axis and its precession, its movement, its rotation, okay? Like creating a circle. Uh, that creates four types of uh, consequences. There are many. These are the four crucial ones. Both star changes because the point of north celestial point changes. Okay. The next one is the nakshatra for the position of the sun at any given point actually along the ecliptic. But that can be confusing. So it's easy to say the nakshatra for the position of the sun at a cardinal point. Example, spring equinox, fall equinox, winter solstice, summer solstice. That changes. And how frequently it changes, how fast it changes. It's a very, very slow process. It changes about one nakshatra every 1,000 years. Okay, a crude number, but pretty accurate, reasonably one. The third one is essentially a consequences of number two. Because the sun's position at, say, any cardinal point, let's take summer solstice, it changes. And when we say sun's position changes, we mean sun's next reference nakshatra changes. Well, guess what? That sun being at a certain cardinal point defines the season. Now, when sun's position at a certain cardinal point changes with respect to nakshatra because of the precession of the earth's axis, guess what? When a certain season occurs with respect to the sun's position, it also changes. Now, if you want to know when that happens, what is the corresponding lunar month? What do we need to do? Just exactly look at the full moon that is occurring, that when the moon is opposite to that position of the sun at a specific cardinal point, note down the nakshatra of that full moon, and you know the lunar month. Since sun's position at a very specific cardinal point with respect to nakshatra is changing, guess what? The corresponding lunar month that corresponds to that sun's position and therefore a specific season is also going to change. So if you take say lunar month of Chaitra and in our times, it coincides with the second part of spring season. If we go in future, next 26,000 years, you know what you're going to find? The lunar month of Chaitra right now, it is in the second part of Sharad season after, sorry, spring season, Vasanta Rutu. After 2,000 years, it will be into first part of Grishma. After 4,000 years, it will be into second part of Grishma, so on. And in 26,000 years, lunar month of Chaitra would have gone through every single season and every single part of the season. If you understand that, you understood number three. This is the basic fundamental consequences of this precession of the Earth's axis. But many trolls, my trolls, I would say, have uh, such a low intellect or maybe they have lost their intellect because of the emotion, neg negative emotion they have against me or because their research have been falsified decisively because of my work and therefore they are upset, which is which basically tells they don't have a scientific acumen or because of the dvesha. Like Nayadarshana says, only three reasons why people make blunders. Tatrairasham ragat dvesha moha arthantara bhavat. Okay, dvesh, like asuya, what we call, you know, like uh, feeling, uh, what you say, anger, whatever frustration, whatever you want to call it, you know, against me. And that causes them to say all kinds of rubbish, all kinds of stupid things, all kinds of non-scientific things, all kinds of illogical things. So when they make uh, arguments against me, I do not want you to accept either my argument or their argument blindly, but use your own intellect to decide who is right, okay? So that's uh, happening for all these three, but especially point number three, even the first whole star. Uh, going back, I don't, and so this is not about any individual, this is about the vritti, about the attitude or lack of intellect, lack of buddhi. Uh, this was, I think, end of 2016. I was at a conference in Delhi 
and two PhDs there, you know, uh, God knows what area they were studying, but the parts of science or engineering. So don't just go by the titles. They were fighting with me for a close to two hours on the sidelines of a conference. And you know what uh, the reason, I mean, what was the subject? They were so stuck when I said that because of the precession of the Earth's axis, the pole star is going to change. And they were saying they were, they belong to certain sampradaya. I forgot the exact details. And they were worried, oh my God, so what will happen to the story of Bhagavad Purana? The problem is, if you understand any of our ancient Indian narratives in a dogmatic fashion and without the Nyaya, Mimamsa, Tarka, Viveka, common sense, a good discernment in a very Shuddha Sattvic Buddhi, it's going to take you on all kinds of tangents. That's why Shankaracharya said, Jnanam na Purusha Tantram Kintu Vastu Tantram. 90% of the things in the world, they can be understood by asking the question to that thing itself in an empirical fashion. Okay, They are not to be taken on some blind faith, but that's what people do. The last one is uh, because the point, uh, because the earth's axis where it's pointing is changing. That's the point of NCP. And at any given point, all the stars of that area, the, the polar region, they tend to uh, they tend to meaning they just they go or they appear to go around that point of NCP or SCP. We will stick to NCP, northern region. And since the point of NCP changes because of the precession of the Earth's axis, the relative position of a star pair as is seen from the Earth as it goes around that NCP may change over time because NCP is changing. And that has a direct implication for the most important, the crucial Mahabharat astronomy evidence of, of all times, but especially of 21st century, because finally it was demystified by me in 21st century in 2009. And that is Arundhati Vasishta observation. Okay. So those are the four consequences. Very important. Everywhere. In dating Ramayana, dating Mahabharata, dating Sushruta, dating um, the updates to Puranas, because Puranas are a Smriti literature, such as Vishnu Purana, um, Bhagavad Purana, uh, Maitrayani, Aranyak, Maitrayani, Upanishad, and so on. If the evidence exists, and evidence is of a quality which allows us to eliminate certain area or narrow it down to certain area. These four consequences can be employed to understand a time period, time interval, when something might have happened, whatever that is, whether it's an update, whether it's a historical event or so on. All right. With that, let's go to a quick demonstration of these four consequences. Here, we can quickly look at two consequences. The first one is a change of pole star. Okay, now look at this point NCP. We will focus only on the northern hemisphere, so NCP. At the center is the Earth. The axis is going through it. If it's extended in the north direction, that's the that will touch the sky, so to say. That's NCP, point of NCP. If it goes in the south, SCP, we are not going to look at the south. Okay, so... What happens? This is how uh, I'm going to start 26,000 years in the past and go around. See, look at this Earth's axis. Its inclination, it's not like going this like this, it's going like this, but the inclination is maintained and it is going around that. Now the inclination or that angle, the obliquity does change, but for these purposes, we are going to assume that to be constant. It changes from 22.5 to 24.5. We are going to assume constant, say 24, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter for these purposes, okay? So you saw exactly what is the fundamental phenomenon. It is the precession of the Earth's axis, like the way I showed it to you here. Okay, let's go again, focus on that NCP. Okay, the Earth axis where it's pointing to, it is going like this and completing one circle and that takes 26,000 years. Now, as it completes the circle, look on the left. There are two circles there. The one at the top, we can call it NCP circle. That is North Celestial Point Circle at the top. The bottom is SCP, South Celestial Point Circle. Now, the pink dot that you see here and the green dot here are the points of NCP. Now, what happens? 
let's reset again going back to 26,000 years and let's start a little bit and I'm going to stop it just so that you can see the current pole star. This is Polaris, that is our current pole star. And at any given day, you will see all these stars going around that NCP. If the NCP changes, then all the stars in that polar region go around that NCP. Keep that in mind because we need that for understanding consequence number four. So as the point of this NCP moves, okay, the pole star will change. Why? Because if there is a bright visible pole star near that point of NCP at any given specific time, then that star acts like a pole star. Where I stopped this is approximately uh, 14,000 years in the past, about say 12,000 BC. That's where I stopped. That is the time of Ramayana. And this star here, bright star, the brightest star in this entire NCP circle region is known as Brahmarashi or Abhijit or Vega. These are the same names, different names of the same star. And Ramayana describes this star. He says, Brahma Rashir Vishuddhasya Shuddhasya Paramarshya Archishmanta Prakashante Dhruvam Sarve Pradakshinam. Brahma Rashi was the pole star at the time of Ramayana. Guess what? In the southern direction, it gives sufficient evidence to say that the Canopus or uh, Agastya had become a pole star in the southern region. Okay. And so that description is also given. The Vanara party has to go all the way to the southern tip of India and climb Mount Mahindra before they could see uh, star Agastya or Canopus at the time of Ramayana. In our times, guys, we can see it from Delhi. We don't have to climb the top of the mountain. Now, you might have to clop, climb the building and Delhi pollution, light pollution and other pollution you may not be able to see. That's a different matter. But otherwise, if the skies were clear, yeah, you could see from the ground even, okay, the in the southern direction. So that's the first aspect of it. Okay, let's complete this circle. I'll stop it one more time to just show you something else. Okay, so I'm going to stop it around the, here 3000 and I'll just let it go a little bit so you can see this star here. This star, star is uh, called Thuban. Okay, it's number 14 star into this uh, uh, Draco constellation or in Indian context, Shishu Mar constellation, 14 star. And we have sufficient descriptions in our ancient Indian narratives, uh, which state that just like Brahma Rashi is described as a pole star at the time of Ramayan or two pole stars like this case here, beautiful case, okay, is described in Surya Siddhanta, but not just that one description. There are a couple other descriptions of very specific, unique type of astronomy situation and those three references from Surya Siddhanta also take you to 12,000 BC, basically the time of Ramayana and Valmiki Ramayana also supports that. That's how old ancient Indian astronomy is, ancient Indian civilization is. Now this one going back to 3000 BC is very well described in our ancient Indian narratives, okay? But something else, whether Brahmarashi becoming a pole star or Thuban becoming a pole star, this is possible if you understand, and it's already described, Ramayan, Surya Siddhanta, and many ancient Indian narratives for Thuban. This is only possible if you truly understand that this precession of a full complete cycle, 360 degree happens. Now you say, yeah, everyone knows that. Well, it, not quite. There are extremely dogmatic Indic researchers who have some totally weird idea of how this procession happens. They think of this procession not going through 360 degree, but kind of like going like a wiper of the wiper blade of the car, you know, which clears the window going back and forth in 27 plus minus 27 degree. That's not the subject, but remember that that's the kind of idiocy does exist in our system. The reasons could be many, but Notwithstanding the evidence, these people will hang on to their dear life to for whatever reason, okay, out of stupidity, out of dvesha for somebody, or out of emotional attachment to God knows what. Okay, anyways. So, yes, we have this here, and let's complete that cycle. So that's that's effect number one. Let's look at effect number two. Now, for understanding effect number two, it will help if you focus on the point of summer solstice and the Earth's inclination. 
Okay, so you can see the Earth's inclination at the point of summer solstice. It's like you can say where the Earth's inclination is at the point of summer solstice, the sun comes closest to that inclination in a simple layman language. In a practical or in a theoretical sense, what it happens is the sun's rays come to the northern hemisphere in this case directly, much, much more directly than any other time. And therefore, it's the peak of summer. We call it summer solstice, 21st June. In a generic sense, the longest day, the shortest night. In a generic sense. Okay. Now, because of the precession of the Earth's axis, I want you to focus on the point of summer solstice. What's happening? The Earth's axis is going like this. And wherever the Earth is inclined, when the maximum, when the sun comes there, that is the point of summer solstice. If Earth's axis is moving, then actually the point of summer solstice is moving. Okay, that's very easy to understand. So let's do that. So now this time you only focus on this line here, the inclination, but the point of summer solstice. Do not focus on anything else. Okay, and see how the point of summer solstice is moving. Technically, why that point is moving? Because Earth's axis is moving and Earth's axis is inclined. Where it has the highest incline, the closest to the sun, so to say, that is the point of summer solstice. The remaining three points, the cardinal points, are tightly linked to the point of summer solstice. Winter solstice is 180 degree opposite. The other two are 90 degrees away from summer solstice. So they will also move. That's given. This is, uh, this is uh, the effect of precession number two that we discussed. Okay. Let's, let's go and... discuss the effect number three all right so let's do that all right all right here uh yes so let me share this okay we are going to look at the effect number three it is really an extension of what i just showed you effect number two for example, the point of summer solstice is going to move with respect to nakshatra. So yeah, let's bring that up. Okay, so I got the point of ecliptic or cardinal points that I just described. See, this is the point of summer solstice. Here, Earth is shown as straight. Well, that's just how we look at it. I can change the angle and it will look exactly like what you have seen before. But it is easy to read this. So therefore, I'm changing it. So what Earth now looks straight, but it's still inclined because now I have inclined the ecliptic. That's the point of summer solstice. Let's add the sun and let's add the seasons. This is our tropical calendar. To that, if I add the moon, then I got a, uh, I can use this arrangement to either use uh, mimic a Gregorian calendar, which is purely tropical solar calendar, or I can use this to mimic a a purely lunar calendar, for example, Islamic calendar. But both of these calendars do not take into account the background nakshatra reference system. In that sense, uh, they are very limited in their applications. In terms of knowing the time accurately over a time period of one's life, knowing the seasons, yeah, tropical calendar does a very decent job, okay? Uh, the lunar, purely lunar calendar, no, actually it doesn't do a good job. It's kind of a disaster, okay? But say for in Islam, for their religious purposes, that does a job. Like they count 12 rotations and the, the lunar year is over, okay? It does create some problems. Like, you know, when they the way they count the year versus rest of the folks are going to count the years is going to be different. But that's not a subject today. Now let's add the nakshatra reference frame. Okay, and I want to show you now what happens, how the lunar month changes. Okay, so for example, uh, let's see uh, if if somebody asks you, even in the Indian context, and my trolls are totally stuck into that foolishness. If somebody asks uh, you or open a panchang, or hey, what do you know? Uh, uh, which lunar months occur during the Vasanta Rutu or spring season? Don't be surprised if you or somebody else answers, oh, that's during Chaitra and Vaishak. It's the Vasanta Rutu. The reality is that was what, when we say Chaitra Vaishak aligned with the Vasanta Rutu, actually that was the scenario 2000 years ago. 
okay? For example, here, okay? So let's look at, they started, uh, let me just do one more time here, reset. This is how the situation was, for example, in 2023 but let's let's start here we'll come to 2023 in a minute so uh da, da, da. okay let me do this here all right so let me get to this first full moon okay i started from the day of vernal equinox my sun is in the second part of vasanta and if you look at uh the full moon it is at nakshatra vishakha therefore uh, using the rules of lunar month, lunar Indian lunar solar calendar, this is a month of Vaishakha. I'm showing you the situation that existed 2000 years ago, not today. I'll show you what happens today. Okay. So the second month of Vasanta Rutu 2000 years ago coincided more or less with a Vaishakha month. Okay. Now, if you want to see what was the first month, well, I'm going to show it to you by bringing the sun here into the first part of Vasanta, but we don't need to wait. Actually, all we need to do is say, if my sun is here, what is the nakshatra that's exactly opposite of it? Well, that's a chitra, about chitra. So this is what is going to happen. When sun enters the first part of Vasanta Rutu, like here, just now, like this, okay? And uh, exactly opposite, so let me go back once or somewhere here. What is my nakshatra? Nakshatra is a hasta or nearby chitra. So using that same law, I will say, ah, so chait ch chitra nakshatra, this appears to be the full moon of chaitra. It is a chaitra mass. So in 2000 years ago, chaitra and vaishak were the two months of Vasanta Rutu. Now fast forward to our times. Let's come to 2023. Our times, let me reset it. This is how the situation was in 2023, this year. That's not always the case because when the sun comes at the point of vernal equinox, it always may not be Amavasya. But this year, think of 20, 20th of March or 21st of March, the situation was like that. The next day was the Gudi Padwa Ugadi, the first day of the Hindu lunar calendar year, so to say. Okay, all right. Now, if we start from here, what do we find? Let's go until we go to the point of full moon. The full moon, this is our time. Notice what nakshatra it is, chitra. 2000 years before, it would have fallen around Vishakha. Why is this happening? Because of the precession of the earth's axis. Therefore, the sun's position with respect to specific part of the season, nakshatra position is changing. Therefore, the opposite position where the full moon would be also changes. Okay, And based on that nakshatra, we decide what is the lunar month. So in our times, actually what's happening is the first month of Vasanta Rutu is month of Falgun. The second month of Vasanta Rutu is month of Chaitra. Unlike 2000 years ago when it was Chaitra and Vaishak. Now let me take you back. Okay, I'm going to show you quickly two scenarios. Uh, so let's go to the time of Mahabharata. Again, let me reset. And let me start here. I am going to take you all the way when sun reaches the point of winter solstice. We will look at one set of beautiful, remarkable, crucial evidence from the Mahabharata text, namely Bhishma Nirvan. Bhishma was waiting on the bed of arrows, waiting for the day of winter solstice, Uttarayan, to leave his body. Okay. Now, Mahabharata tells us that Bhishma was on the bed of arrows for a minimum of 95 days. Okay, so let's do that. So if you want to find out when did the Mahabharata war begin, we have to go back at least 95 days to find out the 10th day of the war, at least I'm saying, okay, when Bhishma fell in the battle. How do we do that? From winter solstice, we are going backwards now. Look, I'm doing a minus one here. So when the Hemantarutu began, we have got 60 days. We have to go for 95. So we keep on going through the second part of uh, Sharath season. Now we are at the middle of the Sharath season. So about 90 days, 60 days of Hemanta and 30 days of Sharath are gone. Now what we need to do, let me just adjust this, sorry. Let me adjust. We have to now go five additional days to go to 95. So one, two, three, four, five. At least we have to go that far back to get to the day of when Bhishma fell in the battle. 
But Bhishma fell in the battle on the 10th day. So we have to go back additional 10 days to get to the first day of the war. Okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. At least this far back we have to go to get, the, get to the first day of the Mahabharata war. So clear. No ifs and buts, no questions, no confusion. Now, notice the season. It is the first part of the Sharad season. That's when the Mahabharata war began. This is purely based on the duration of Bhishma on the bed of arrows and when Bhishma fell in the battle. Tenth day. Now, what ought to be the lunar month of that time? Well, in from a tradition or from the Mahabharata text evidence itself, we have sufficient evidence to say that it was the month of Margashesha. Now look at it. In order for us to have the first part of the Sharad season and the lunar month of Margashirsha, we need Mrugashirsha nakshatra somewhere in the first part of this area, exactly opposite of the position of the uh, sun. Guess what? If you want that, you need to go back to 6th millennium BC, 5561 BC. That's when the first part of Sharad season coincided with the lunar month of Mrugashirsha. Okay, that's the beauty. That's how you can tell. Now quickly, one I will show you only one more here. Go, let's go back to the time of Ramayana about 14,000 years ago to the year 12,209 BC. Let me reset this again. Where they are right now, where we begin. Okay, just imagine if uh, the uh, time was that of the Vasanta Rutu, and we go to the full moon. So let's do that. Okay. Uh, here. Yeah. So we are at the full moon. And where is, what is the nakshatra? Nakshatra is a barni, which is what? Close to Ashwini or Krutika. So it is like a month of Ashwin or Krutika. If you just quickly visually look at the first part of Sharad, you will see like a Purva Bhadrapad, Uttara Bhadrapad, Revati. So very likely we can take this, this time as first part of Vasanta Rutu to be Bhadrapada, second part to be month of Ashwin, somewhere like that. What, what this has to do with the Ramayana? Well, I have directly taken you to the timing of Ramayana. But now, how I figured this out using this precession of the Earth's axis and its consequences, that's what I'm trying to explain. When Vanara party is going in the south direction and Angada is frustrated, Angada is saying, hey, look, we started looking for Sita at the end of Sharad Rutu when the sun was here. We have searching for Sita for a very long time. The two months of Hemanta, two months of Shishira, that has gone and possibly the first month of Vasanta is gone. I'll come to that. So five months have gone. Sugriv had given us only a time limit of one month. We have not found Sita yet. What are we going to do? How are we going to accomplish our task? And do we dare even go back to Sugriva? Okay. In that frustrated state, he's saying, look here. We started at the end of Sharad, we have gone through Hemanta, we have gone through some tough times where it was hard to find food and so on. And now we see all the signs of Vasanta Rutu. Not only that, even that seems to be elapsing. And he refers to the lunar month of Ashwin. Okay, here. So very likely it was the second part of Vasanta Rutu. And he's saying it is the month of Ashwin. He's looking at it. He's just looking at the moon phases, moon position and making that judgment. He says, Vayam Ashwayuje Masi Kala Sankhya Vivastita Ashwayuje Ashwin Prastita Sopi Chatita Kimata Tarim Uttaram. How are we going to accomplish the task? That situation, that particular reference takes you to 13 millennium BC, this one, particular 12,209. Let's go further. We are going to look at quickly two references. Now we will go to uh, Sharad Rutu, okay, when the moon, is very, when the sun reaches the position of Sharad and we will look at the full moon like this. Okay, where is it? Sharad has begun and the full moon is near Uttara Falguni Hasta Chitra, which means what? Very likely the month of Chaitra. First month, and if you go to the second one, okay, and we, we will go there. But the point is, the first month uh, of Sharad coincided with the lunar month of Chaitra at that time, and those are the descriptions, many descriptions you find in the Valmiki Ramayana. Again, here my trolls and their blind followers have made a royal disaster. Okay, when time permits, I will talk about it. But this is creating a background so that everyone understands what's going on. 
And uh, if you, of course, go to the second month, then you will find that was the month of Vaishak. Okay, that's when Ram, of course, so this is the time, the Sharad Ritu, when Ram is born. Okay, Chaitra Shukla Nomi. It was a Sharad Ritu when Ram was sent to one verse because it was his like 17, 18 birthday. And when Ram finally killed Ravana, it was at the Chaitra Amavasya and uh, then within five, six days, he came to Ashram of Bharadwaj using Pushpak Viman. That was Vaishak Shukla Panchami. And then he met Bharad on Vaishak Shukla Shashti on the day of Pusha Nakshatra. Okay. But one more quick reference and then we'll go to the effect number four. That one reference I want to take you is the part of Hemantarutu here. Okay. Just as a last reference, I'm going to take you to the end of Hemantarutu here. Winter solstice is the last day of Hemantarutu, but you can take it before and that's fine. I took it, took you to the day of winter solstice because for people who cannot visualize uh, sun setting and then people visualizing a nakshatra such as Pusha, this one is easy for easy for them to visualize. Ah, it sun is right at Pusha. This is the Pusha nakshatra here. Lakshman is describing the Hemanta Rutu, the second part of Hemanta Rutu of Ramayana times. And he's telling Ram and Sita, he's saying, Nivrutta Akasha Shayana Pushanita Himaruna. He's describing the journey of a sun right from the morning to the noon to the end of the day. And he's saying, sun sets during this beautiful Hemanta Rutu on Pushya Nakshatra. It is setting on Pushya Nakshatra. That time also takes you to 12,209. Whereas if you have to look at it today, it sits on about, I would say, Uttarashada uh, Mula Nakshatra. That's that's a reality in 2023, for example. Okay, so that's just giving you explanation of how the lunar month shifts with respect to season because of the precession. All right, so we got that. Let me stop sharing. And what I want to do, the last one, is... Arundhati Vasishta, and that has to do with the change of relative positions, change of relative positions of the stars or twin stars or stars next to each other or a star pair and their orientation as seen from the earth when they go around the point of NCP. Okay, so let me do that. All right, and it's here. So this is the last one, guys. Okay, so we have looked at the point of NCP. Okay, so let's say we look at our time, 2023, this year. Okay, let me take away the horizon. Okay. And if we let this go, this is the circle that kind of defines the distance of the Saptarshi from the point of NCP in the current year, 2023. Saptarshi is kind of shown so that you have a orientation in the sky. Okay, so if you look in the north direction right now, look at this star here next to it, next to the pink one, that star is the Polaris. And it is almost there at the pink dot, but not exactly. So as if like that star is rotating around the pink dot. But pink dot, there is nothing. It's just a imaginary point where Earth's axis is hitting the sky, so to say. But that polar is, is so close that as if it's not moving. In fact, I would encourage all of you to go and watch the night sky, okay? And look at the polar is. You know, you may watch it, look at the positions of other stars, then go for a night walk for two hours, then come back and look at it. You'll see other stars have moved, but not Polaris. And that's what you're seeing in the picture. This line is just a reference line for people who are not very visual. It helps them. I'm going to remove that. Now notice how the orientation of the Saptarshis is as they go around the NCP. That orientation in the 24 hours as they go around day after day for a given time, 1,000, 2,000 years, is not changing at all. Okay, now let's notice who is walking ahead and who is walking behind between the star pair Arundhati and Vasishta. I'm going to pause it for a second. In this star, this is a 
four rect four star rectangle, then three tail stars. The middle star is Vasishta. Next to that is a small star is Arundhati. Now notice who is walking ahead, who is walking behind. Now you don't need this if you are even have a decent idea of how to look at geometric shapes or the motions. Okay, circular motions, angular motions. So here. This vertical line is the line of meridian. It's an imaginary line, useful in many ways. If you look at it, you will notice that it is the vasishta that goes ahead, Arundhati, behind. Now, there are atrociously nonsensical Mahabharata researcher or Indic researchers who are in their foolishness think that it's only the meridian when we can decide or when somebody goes ahead of somebody. No, that's utter nonsense. In this picture, if I remove the meridian, a person with even a very basic common sense understanding of how to look at the circular motion will able to say, ah, this Vasishta is walking ahead, Arundhati is walking behind. Those people who cannot imagine that meridian kind of helps them. Just say, hey, just like the running race, who cross the meridian first? That is not to say that only Vasishta is ahead of Arundhati only at Meridian. No, that is utter nonsense, utter foolishness, but many Mahabharata researchers are doing that nonsense. Okay. All right. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you back by 1000 years. So instead of 2023, I will take you back to 1000. Notice what is happening uh, to, the, to the space between the Saptarshis and NCP. In fact, what I can do is I can walk, take you through the 26,000 year cycle around the NCP. Okay. And if you want to see what is happening, how the distance of Saptarshi is changing with respect to NCP, it may be useful to have this circle. Okay. This point NCP is far away and now it's coming closer and it's going far away again. Why is that? Because in reality, what is happening, it is the point of NCP that's going around along that NCP circle. That's what we just saw. Okay. And so depending on when it is, what time it is, sometime it will appear close to Saptarshi, other times it will appear far away from Saptarshis. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to pause this and take you back to that thousand. Okay. So thousand years before and you can look at the orientation I have placed the meridian there just notice here also without meridian I can say that a Saptarshi is ahead um, sorry Vasishta is ahead and Arundhati is behind okay but you can notice it here excellent now we will go two thousand years before now notice who is ahead who is behind again you will find that when uh, otherwise you would know but when it crosses meridian easy to see Vasishta is ahead and Arundhati is behind. Let's go back to 1000 BC. So I'm typing minus 1000. Again, you will find Vasishta is ahead, Arundhati is behind. By this time, you should be trained enough. You don't have to wait for a meridian to come to figure this out. Okay, it does get a little bit tricky, especially if you are uh, a uh, uh, blabbering baby in astronomy as we get uh, to our interesting period. Here also, 2000 BC, you see Vasishta ahead, Arundhati behind. Very interesting period, 3000 BC. Why interesting? Again, Vasishta is ahead, Arundhati is behind. And this is the reason why majority of Mahabharata researchers are rattled. Why are they rattled? Because with their methods or lack of methods, lack of scientific acumen, lack of theory, lack of logic, lack of ability to objectively test evidence, lack of bringing things together, which is again scientific acumen, they have created havoc. Most of them are lazy enough that they just take somebody's date and just keep on shouting it is the same day. But Arundhati Vasishta observation and its objective testing has rattled them. How many of them are rattled? Practically 99% of the Mahabharata dating researchers have, are rattled because their research has been falsified by this one Arundhati Vasishta observation, one shlok. Vyasadev is saying at the time of Mahabharata war, it is the Arundhati that is walking ahead of Vasishta and not Vasishta walking ahead of Arundhati. We started with our times, 2023. Vasishta is walking ahead of Arundhati. We went back 1000 years, Vasishta is walking ahead. 
we went 2000 back 2000 years was sister is walking ahead we went back 3000 years was sister is walking ahead we went back 4000 years was sister is walking ahead we went back to 5000 years to 3000 bc was sister is walking ahead this is why they are rattled and is this one observation sufficient to falsify them the answer is yes because this is a crucial observation watch my other videos as to decide or watch read the modern scientific revolution of last 500 years that happened in western europe to understand what is a crucial experiment what is a crucial evidence and how uh, a theory gets falsified this is a crucial evidence this is not some repetitive evidence that gets repeated every month every year no 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 in fact in the history of the earth let's say if you have to go for take i don't know 100000 years 200000 years uh, itihasic you know history 3,000, 300,000 years, 400,000 years, million years, 2 million, 3 million years. Guess what? Only one time interval I'm going to show you, and you have seen it. Hopefully, you have seen it before. I have talked about this hundreds of times. Only one interval of 5,000 years out of this 100,000, 200,000, 300,000, 1 million, 2 million, 3 million years. Only one small interval of 5,000 years when Arundhati is walking ahead of Vasishta. And Vasudeva has said, hey, in the Mahabharata was, war was happening, Arundhati was walking ahead of a sister. Let's go back to quickly uh, 4,000 because I want to show you how it can get tricky for uh, naive individuals or novice individuals. Now here, I want you to notice when it crosses the meridian, who is going ahead? Okay, let me see if I can stop it. Look here, who is going ahead? Answer is Vasishta is going ahead, then Arundhati, okay, here. Okay, the orientation is such. And what might help is to draw, sorry, draw this line. Okay, so everything same. Just this is the point of NCP. I have created this NCP circle. It has the markers for the time. But what is important, I'll just stop it so you can see it, relative position. This dotted line is drawn, how? Essentially, a straight line that goes through the core of Vasishta, core of Arundhati, and when it's extended, it cuts the NCP circle, and it cuts the NCP circle twice, like a cord, okay? So this portion, this arc here, okay, it so happens that when the point of NCP is anywhere along this arc, which is to say from 46, 36 BC to 10,248 BC, magic happens. Anyone standing on the earth, looking at the northern hemisphere, looking at the point of NCP and looking at all the stars going around that point of NCP, including Saptarshi and including Vasishta and Arundhati, they will see Arundhati is walking ahead of Vasishta. Okay, not, okay, so let's do that. So for example, uh, I will take you to 5561 BC, the year of Mahabharata war, and let's rotate. it. And let's see if I can stop it when it gets there. It doesn't matter, okay? At any given time, actually, Arundhati is walking ahead of a sister. But the difference is so small that it may not be obvious, especially for a naive or uh, novice individual here, okay? So let's, therefore, the dotted line might help, okay? So look at the angle of a dotted line. And imagine those two stars are at the exactly same position core in reality arundhati is smaller but you may ignore that for now look which star is coming first it is the arundhati that's coming first before vasishta okay and guess what that is always so ncp is where between this point and this point so along this arc it doesn't matter where ncp is along this arc arundhati will always walk ahead Okay, so that's like a time period of what? Time period of about 5,000 years. Okay, from, I'll pause it when it gets there so that you can read the numbers uh, with ease. Okay, like here. Anytime the point of NCP is along this arc, which is to say anytime after 10,248 and before 4636 BC, anyone on the earth looking at the northern direction at night or whenever they can see Arundhati Vasishta go around the point of NCP, guess what? Arundhati would be ahead. Now, from that, how did I arrive at only one particular year? So this is what? 
10,248 to 4636, about 5,000 years. How did I arrive at one year? Based on additional evidence. The Bishma Nirvana evidence that I discussed or the uh, uh, Arundhati, sorry, the planetary evidence. There are 50 plus different descriptions. And when you look at 300 plus evidence, as astronomy evidence, and you start putting together as if putting together the pieces of jigsaw puzzle or reading the clues and applying that information, like the way we do that in a crossword, solving a crossword puzzle, it takes you to only one year, 55, 61 BC. But the point is that Arundhati Vasishta was a most crucial observation, just like Bhishma Nirvana was. Now, some people fight Arundhati Vasishta, forgetting, now that fight itself is idiotic, but forgetting that the Bhishma Nirvana is also going to take you to that place. I showed you what does Bhishma Nirvana evidence says? That Mahabharata war happened about 7,000, 8,000 years ago. What does Arundhati Vasishta says? It says Mahabharata war happened before 4636 BC and after 10,248 BC, which means what? It happened more than 6,500 years ago. That's what Arundhati Vasishta observation says. What does Bhishma Nirvana evidence says? It happened more than 7,000 years ago. Bingo. And if you look at additional evidence, it takes you to 5561 BC. What does that tell you? It happened 7,584 years ago. If we are talking about this in the year 2023. That's it, guys. Those are the four consequences due to the precession of the Earth's axis. And... Yeah. All right. Uh, you can watch the uh, other four uh, parts for additional details. But if this one summary part, that would be about 60 minutes, I presume. If that does a job for you, you may or may not have to watch the other parts. Okay. Namaskar.